Thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, it's been great to hear all of the innovations in, obviously, digital health technology and data analytics um, that are changing healthcare and that landscape. At Greenberg Trarg, we have the opportunity to represent clients uh, both in the U.S., so domestically and internationally in this space, and really see the future of healthcare. And uh, it's my pleasure to be able to do that. Um, and, but we needed to give you a little taste of uh, the regulatory landscape and how uh, the utilization of all of that data, both the creation, storage, uh, use, and access to it, is something that is being uh, has been and is being even more now uh, at the forefront of the regulatory f um, focus of governments, uh, both uh, the U.S. And, and internationally as well. Um, pleased to have my colleague uh, Carson, who's uh, in our Berlin office, is going to be speaking to you about the EU and U.K. regulatory landscape, and I'm going to give you a taste of the, the U.S. front. Uh, of course, we have, I think, 30 minutes or so to, to do that. We're going to be doing it at a fairly high level. Um, but give you the opportunity to utilize these slides and um, make reference to them, you know, going uh, for, there's our faces, nice. Um, so these are the areas that we're going to, you know, touch on. But as I was indicating, the privacy trends um, essentially, essentially has become a geopolitical um, event. The, 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 the concept of the privacy being on that world stage and, you know, what it really means is that all countries around the world are really focusing in on how data is being collected, uh, how it's being utilized, and even more so has come to the forefront as consumers uh, and their expectations of how their data is being utilized is obviously being triggered by public events, uh, whether they be cybersecurity uh, events and breaches. Um, you, everyone has gotten a notice that their personal data has been compromised because there's been a cybersecurity event, um, whether it's a bank or you know, credit en entity or a hospital. And so there has been a change in you know, that perception, uh, how the public is otherwise uh, expecting uh, not only um, hospitals and health systems and, and other players within the healthcare industry, but um, even on the consumer platform. We represent a lot of digital health um, tech platforms that are more consumer initiated. Um, it's consumer driven, a uh, number of products you know, that have been talked about here on that, on that uh, forefront, and they're being subject to more regulatory um, restrictions and, and requirements as well, which which we'll talk about. So what we're going to do is essentially talk through how this has progressed. Um, GDPR, um, you know, Karsten will talk about next, um, but how the U.S. has been following suit. The difficulties that the U.S. has been facing is this is now regulated at both the federal and um, multiple state level. Uh, and touch upon those states and, and give you a sh uh, a, an idea of where this is going. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we don't have all states playing in this market yet, but uh, soon enough uh, we think that they, they will be, and uh, we'll talk about the federal legislation that's uh, being proposed to talk about that. So here's just a cool uh, slide about the time frame and um, the privacy legislation that's coming out, what's um, to become effective uh, at the state level. Uh, but let's take the time now to turn it over to Karsten and talk about the GDPR. All right. Thanks, Charles. Um, so now, <coughs> GDPR. Uh, first of all, b before, before I get into the details of GDPR, it's important to understand that when you're talking or when we're talking about the transfer or processing of personal health data, uh, in Europe, GDPR is one of uh, several regulations and directives that may or may not apply. You probably heard of the uh, NIST directive. Uh, there's a Medical Devices Act, and there's an elect electronic health um, data regulation uh, coming up in the future. Uh, but for several reasons, GDPR is the most important aspect. Uh, no, so let's let's go into the de details while we're talking about GDPR. What is it? <clears throat> GDPR is a regulation uh, that unifies uh, the, the processing of personal data uh, in Europe. Uh, by the way, it, uh, Europe means, uh, first of all, European Union, so it's the 27 member states of European Union, uh, but it also includes more or less, to some extent, uh, data processing in UK and Switzerland and in the other member states of the European Economic Area, uh, which are Liechtenstein, uh, Norway and, uh, and Iceland. Uh, so it, it, it provides you, um, from the business perspective, with a really, uh, pr really good advantage of when you're doing business in Europe, uh, you need to comply uh, with the GDPR and uh, more or less 
that harmonized law allows you to, uh, to be in compliance with your data processing activities all over Europe. Uh, it, it has entered into effect in May 2018. Uh, and why does it matter? I think that's the most important aspect. Why do you want to be compliant with GDPR? Well, first of all, uh, it has a really, really severe scheme of uh, penalties. Uh, and if you have followed lately what happened on, on, on that front, you might know that uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the, one of the most drastic fines ever imposed in, in Europe uh, was issued by the Luxembourg Authority against Amazon, uh, worth 740 million euros. Uh, and then uh, some weeks ago, two other fines that are significant have been imposed against uh, WhatsApp and uh, against Instagram, uh, worth 225 and 405 million. Uh, so that, that is a good incentive <laughs> to, to be compliant with GDPR. Uh, but, but that's only one part of that, uh, of that aspect. The other part is if you want to extend your business to Europe uh, and you, you, you're acting on the B2B front, that means you, need, you want to engage into, in business with, um, with, European, uh, with Euro European business, uh, you, you can uh, practically only do that business and allow those entities to, uh, to transact and do business with yourself if you can tell them, look, uh, whatever I'm offering you, uh, the technical model, any, any, any my business, my business model uh, is actually compliant with GDPR and it allows you to be compliant with GDPR because otherwise you may be fined um, if, if you use my, my services. So that's something you want to, uh, want to avoid. Um, who does it affect? Um, yeah, GDPR applies to, to any entities that are processing personal data in Europe, uh, no matter where the um, personal data originates from. Uh, but it also applies to uh, non-European countries uh, like US. Uh, if you are um, uh, doing your business or if, you, if you're offering your services to individuals in Europe or if you're uh, monitoring their behavior. Can we go on? Yeah. Uh, so this, these are some, some um, uh, it's a slide with the most Im important um, key definitions that you need to know. Uh, I, I'm not going to read all of that, but um, uh, most important aspects, obviously, personal data. So GDPR applies to any processing of personal data. Personal data is more or less uh, very similar to what you know in the US under PII, so a personal identifiable information and relates to any type of information about a data subject, about an individual uh, by the way, it also includes um, encrypted data. Uh, so just because you may be uh, processing, uh, let's say, medical data, health data, only in an encrypted way, it would still fall under the application of GDPR. That is important to understand. Uh, and you may have already heard of the concepts of res responsibility. You have a controller and you have a processor. And controller is basically that entity that is processing data. Uh, and who's responsible to it uh, towards the authorities and the individuals. individuals. Uh, and the processor is a third party which the controller uses in order to have that data being processed. So a typical example is if, if you're coming up with a business, um, sort of like a technical business solution which allows clients um, or customers to have their end user data being processed through your system, um, you will be typically acting as a processor and not as a controller. Uh, and processing means more or less anything that you do with the data. It's really broad definition, it's really long, but in a nutshell it means any type of uh, handling of data uh, will fall under the in terms of uh, qualify as processing and therefore uh, fall under the GDPR. Um, so next slide, again a really a nice slide which more or less summarizes everything you need to know. If you know that slide then I can actually go home because that says everything you need to know about GDPR. Uh, I'm not going to the details of it, but uh, Maybe, maybe some words, when we talk about legal basis, uh, that means that any type of data processing that you do um, needs, to be, um, uh, needs to have a legal basis. So you need either to have the consent of the individual to process the data, or you need to be able to rely on certain other um, uh, legal justifications, like you've probably heard of the uh, legitimate interest, or processing is necessary to fulfill a legal or statutory requirement, and so on and so forth. Uh, individual rights, that's, um, that's a, a big burden for, for entities and enterprises that are processing data because that means that any individuals uh, without any reason, without any course, may co contact you, for example, and ask for a copy of the data. They can ask you to transfer the data to another uh, company uh, and have many, many other rights. Um, and if you don't follow their rights and uh, their claims, uh, you may be fined. 
Um, and I'm not going through all of those, but uh, interesting, probably interesting aspect is uh, data security and data transfers outside of the EEA, which uh, require certain adequate measures. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, can we continue? Yeah. Um, so this is an extra slide which we prepared to um, highlight uh, any, any sharing of health data. Um, uh, important to understand is that the GDPR is sort of like a two-step principle and concept when it comes to the processing of data. Um, all, uh, all requirements apply to the processing of data per se, but when we're talking about health data, what the, laws call, the law calls them the special categories of personal data, uh, then there are higher standards which we need to comply with. And those special categories of personal data include um, uh, you know, data about racial, ethnic, origin, political opinions, uh, and by the way, also your trade union membership, uh, but also data concerning health. So any processing of health data um, has a higher uh, threshold in order to be compliant with GDPR. Um, and that, that boils down, the first of all boils down to the question, may they actually share those data uh, what, what do you need? What is the legitimate um, um, uh, justification for that? And that basically means you can only rely on consent. So whenever you're processing health data of an individual um, uh, with, under the application of GDPR, you need consent unless uh, you have really, really rare uh, exceptions that apply. Um, for example, if the processing is necessary for preventive or occupational medicine or necessary for... Uh, public interest in the area of public health. So, but these are basically the only exceptions that apply. Uh, and I think for, for, for any telehealth providers that do business in, in, in Europe, one of the most important aspects is the data transfer mechanism. Um, so uh, the European, European Commission and the GDPR has a concept which says any data transfer, any transfer of data, person data from the European territory outside to, to, to the third country outside requires additional safeguards which need to be put into place unless the third country has been uh, recognized by the EU Commission as, being, uh, as providing adequate safeguard. Um, and that adequacy decision has been issued to various countries but unfortunately not to the US. Um, data transfers to the US historically have been uh, subject to uh, self-certification regimes uh, like Safe Harbor which was quashed by the European Court of Justice. Justice. And then later the um, data, um, uh, the, the privacy shield, which was again quashed by the European Court of Justice. Uh, and now we have a new self-certification regime uh, coming up on the front. Uh, by the way, interesting enough, uh, President Biden just um, uh, released an executive order last Friday, uh, which is supposed to pave the way to that new uh, self-certification regime. But unless this has been adopted, um, the only way, the only legal way to transfer data from, from the US to Europe is basically having the standard contractual clauses in place, uh, which is a standard contract being adopted by the European Union, uh, by, by the European Commission, uh, which the data exporter in Europe and the data importer uh, in the US need to enter into um, to, to, to make those data uh, transfers being legitimate. Um, yeah, I guess we can call. Yeah. yeah. All right. Back to you. Back. So the uh, sorry, the uh, federal privacy landscape here in the U.S. is, uh, as many of you are familiar with HIPAA and high tech, um, you know that that is essentially it's more limited, obviously, than the GDPR. Right? It it applies only to covered entities, which has a defined definition, and their business associates that they utilize um, to create, use, uh, or have grant access to protected health information. And uh, high tech in, 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 in well, decade plus now has uh, otherwise created significant um, measures in e electronic PHI, um, security management, and incident processes. Um, but what you really hear about most of the time are you know, breaches in the event that there's a breach of that protected health information, um, some big or small, and the, the, the failure to mitigate and the failure or failure to notify those individuals who may have been imp impacted by uh, that breach event. 
So obviously, since we're limited on time, we're not going to spend uh, much on this other than to say, because HIPAA and high tech itself are limited to a specific category of, of data um, and specific category um, of uh, the, the, um, those creators or users of that information, um, there has been additional laws that we will that we'll talk about both at the federal and state level uh, that have been implemented. Many uh, uh, of you and many of the presenters here uh, have, were talking about the interoperability, right? Access to um, patient information, the ability for individuals to get, obtain that information as well as you know, other entities to obtain that information. And so from the Cures Act, and I know we had um, basically, if he's still here, um, obviously uh, a go government representative in talking about the Cures Act and, and, the, and the, the benefits of that law and the regulate rules and regulation that have been put in place. I bring this to everyone's attention so they're aware of it, but uh, the fact is that this law is now creating an, uh, a requirement that e uh, electronic health information, which carries the same um, definition uh, under HIPAA uh, as far as a designated rec uh, record set, it expands those actors who are subject to this law, who must um, s store, permit access to, and um, permit, uh, as we were talking about in the GDPR, those personal rights of individuals. Um, and, and those actors are not only healthcare providers, which has a broader um, definition, but also health IT developers um, and, and health information exchanges and health information networks. One of the other things that I wanted to highlight too is the exceptions. Um, basically, the law says any type of activity <laughs> that uh, blocks someone's uh, access to that information is inherently suspect. So, uh, so the, these are just examples of the exceptions to what would be inherently suspect. I wanted to point out the, that exempts certain fees. I was at a conference and, um, a few weeks back and someone suggested that, um, that there are fees that were otherwise applicable under um, uh, HIPAA and other state laws would be um, no longer permitted. Well, that's not true. Um, this, the, if you really actually read the definition of fees and the exception there, it's actually pretty broad and, it, and still permits the ability to charge those fees. It's just, let's say you've already adopted a portal where patients can otherwise access that information. You've already expended the, the, the resources on that. Well, then at that and to have access to that, you, you're not going to be able to charge them under this law. But it doesn't mean that if you need to go and create the, the, and have access to your system that otherwise doesn't have that interface um, or that's easily um, implemented or otherwise they wanted a copy of their information in a format that is not otherwise um, the electronic access in the way that the, the, that the, the law is otherwise um, created to allow, you can still charge fees. So, and, and, and by you, I mean the, the actors, right? The healthcare providers, the health IT developers, and so on and so forth. So, I think that's something um, to be discussed <laughs> for a little more in, in depth, but that's something that I heard from a conference, and I wanted to highlight it to this group um, because I delved into all of the federal regulations for, for that reason. Now, what I was talking about before was the fact that, and, we'll get, and I'll provide some detail on it, is that states have taken the initiative to implement um, laws at the, at, their, at the state level for uh, personal rights protection of that data, California obviously being one of the pro most prominent. Um, but because of that, there has been initiatives at the federal level, and one of the most prominent of those initiatives is, is the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, which is just a bill, it's, and you know, it's just been introduced. It's not, uh, it hasn't progressed since it's been introduced this summer, but it's intended to um, not go so far as GDPR. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say um, because that's a fairly complex law. Um, but it does, in, in fact, try to create this framework at the federal level for um, personal rights and um, protection of that personal data uh, and access to and officially, you know, um, having to affirmatively opt out and so on and so forth. Well, what's really important is because it's at the federal level, it's a bill that attempt, you know, attempts to and would would preempt certain state laws, um, you know, and, as they exist today. The reality is, and what we're really here to say, is that how you're operating um, in, in the markets and depending on where you're operating, you're going to be subject to 
numerous um, regulatory environments. And this is a law that otherwise is intended to address that uh, as more and more states in the US continue to adopt laws uh, for those reasons. So uh, like I said, we, we can't get into uh, everything. I'm gonna run through these um, five states uh, there and, and, and starting with California. Many of you may be familiar with the California Privacy Rights Act. Um, it, ha it amends and expands upon an existing law, which is a, a California Consumer Privacy Act, which was adopted back, or went into effect back in 2020. Uh, the CPRA will go into effect January 1st, 2023, uh, and uh, it creates additional new rights and imposes um, you know, additional obligations on business um, that are not just within the border of California, but doing business in, in within uh, with the residents within within the state. Uh, again, interestingly enough, it continues to borrow from the GDPR um, by adopting uh, and introducing you know new principles that didn't exist under the the previous law. Um, we're almost getting to be as as stringent <laughs> and complicated as the GDPR, but I always rely upon my friend whenever uh, my clients have questions on on, on that space. So here's a nice little uh, glance. Again, a lot of this is for your reference, um, for you to be able to look back on and understand what your your obligations are going to be when you you know when you're interacting with uh, individuals in California. I this is the you know again like the GDPR. There's certain information that's sensitive personal information that has higher you know categories of, uh, of rights and restrictions. But what I wanted to point out here is something that as, as a lawyer we're always you know advising on like what what do you or don't you know about when you're entering into contractual relationships with your vendors there's going to have to be um, terms uh, within your uh, contract with those vendors that they're going to be um, compliant with these laws and not unlike you know GDPR which is a different framework but um, sort of similar to a business associate agreement when you enter into an agreement you know, business associate, it, not only is the business associate subject to those laws under HIPAA, but now you have a contractual obligation to enter into agreement and say, you will be, we are going to define the, the, the rights and obligations between, between each other. Uh, this, you know, imp imposes that. So uh, you may need to go revisit your agreements with your vendors um, as this law comes in effect in, on January 1st, 2023. Uh, again, here's just a, a breakdown of the um, personal rights uh, that are being representative in in the law in California, um, and it's just a reference tool for you to to be able to go back and look at. So, there's uh, states of uh, other states have followed suit, right? And this is the the whole issue behind the complexity behind the U.S. Um, you know, depending on where you're operating, and if you're doing a 50, if you have 50 state operation in practice, um, you know, you're going to have to understand that these laws either are in place right now or, are, or will be effective um, down the road, uh, and you'll need to come into compliance with them, assuming that federal le legislation doesn't come through, and assuming that the, these state laws aren't more stringent um, in, or in those specific categories that may um, be exempt. So uh, again, uh, no reason for me to go through all of this. Uh, this is, you know, key takeaways um, for those laws in, in Colorado. Um, again, the the you know that the, there this one, of course, it's trying to align with the California, but there's not consistent alignment from state to state. Right? Connecticut itself uh, has and, and tries to mirror some of those provisions within Colorado and California. Uh, but there are differences um, that uh, you know are relatively subtle, and, and some that are pretty significant. And as you move through Utah and Virginia, I mean, I got to tell you, I, I rarely have clients ask me questions about Utah and Virginia, um, but you know they are becoming you know Utah for sure. Um, I mean, our firm just even opened up an office in Salt Lake City a, a year or so back. It's becoming a very large market. Um, I, I find it interesting that Utah is one of the states that have has gone and you know made, made that effort as compared to other states that are, have highly regulated environments. Um, but Utah, you know, does take a little bit of a lighter touch to it than the other states. Uh, and then Virginia itself, uh, again, another uh, state that has adopted and um, will come into place if you look back at the that schedule will come to place i believe they're 2024 um and, and as as they go through so 
you know, these these will continue to evolve. These laws at the state level will continue to, to evolve. Um, a lot of them, again, are not consistent from one to the next, and you have to understand the, the variation um, between between those. Okay. Um, now you already heard a lot about regulation, about, about um, privacy regulation in the US on federal state level, about Europe on the GDPR level. And now I apologize for talking about a little bit more about um, a regulation. Now we're talking about the UK, uh, the new data, UK Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, uh, which is quite interesting. Why? Because it was only um, uh, being put forward some months ago. And uh, it may have the effect, we don't know how it plays, how it would play out in the future, but it may have the effect that the UK uh, data privacy regime will be uh, diverting from what they currently have uh, as inherited from the GDPR. Uh, so as of now, when you're doing um, any, any data transfer, any data processing activities which relate to the UK, and that activity is compliant with GDPR, you can assume that's also compliant with what's required in the UK. And that might change in the future because UK has decided to, um, yeah, to divert away, uh, to, to move away a little bit from, from GDPR um, uh, uh, in, with, the, with the intention to become, I guess, more independent to show that they're not part of the European Union any longer. But also the idea was to, um, to uh, put away certain uh, requirements on the GDPR, which were uh, which are regarded by UK lawmakers to be uh, too burdensome and which should be put away. I don't think we need to go into the details, um, but interesting would be, for example, that the subjective definition of personal data should be introduced. Uh, so, as of now, in Europe, any personal data which is principal is um, there are exceptions, but the principal idea is anything is personal data. Uh, if that data can be linked by anyone to any individual. So that's a standard idea. And even if you have no means of connecting certain information to an individual, it will still be, uh, will still be regarded as personal data which falls under the uh, application of GDPR. And that will, uh, and UK will move away from that uh, if that uh, bill is going to process um, and go move forward. Um, and yeah, some other... Um, some other um, aspects that might make it easier uh, for business to do business uh, for business to process data in the UK. But as of now, I think what's interesting to understand is that UK might be different uh, from GDPR in the future. So here's a helpful comparison slide. This is you know um, you can again reference materials. I believe you all have this material, so you can go and take a look at it. Um, that that we just thought would be useful as uh, you know you're comparing these laws. Um, our firm, as as a whole, um, we have a, a you know maybe people use the word robust. We, we have a, a very prominent <laughs> um, uh, data privacy and cybersecurity group. We were ranked number one in chambers. Um, uh, Carson's actually going off to Chicago tomorrow to present you know on these I on these issues. We have uh, a website that's constantly updated on e these changes and developments. We have resources on our website. So happy to share that type of material with you. Um, you know, it's complicated stuff, but reference materials and, and, and the like really helps digest it, um, give you a path to understanding, you know, that regulatory framework uh, that's out there. We were going to go through a case study. I know we're over time, so uh, <laughs> getting, getting a head shake now. But I want to say um, Carson and I are doing extensive work in um, clinical trials and specifically decentralized clinical trials. Um, utilizing remote patient monitoring, um, utilizing uh, telehealth and the like, and all of those digital health technology. But what was more interesting is um, you have to understand the data that's coming in on the front end, uh, that that data that's coming in is compliant, that you can use that information, um, because there's regulatory frameworks on how you obtain it up front, and then it also pertains to how you can actually utilize that data on the back end, which you know many people are familiar with the FDA and the common rules on human research uh, and that piece of, of the puzzle and getting that informed consent. Um, but there's also now, you know, you have GDPR compliance, you have HIPAA compliance, right? There's a lot of practices out there that are just engaging and acting in these sites uh, and, part, and being part, principal investigators or what have you. The way that they conduct themselves, the way that they pull patient information, the way that they um, recruit subjects into those studies, um, is subject to all of these laws, and so I, you know, just want to emphasize that because we're advising that on a regular basis. 
Uh, and some of these state laws may trigger um, that as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity.